This is Sarah Stewart Holland. And this is Beth Silvers. Thank you for joining us for Pantsu Politics. Hello, thank you for joining us for another episode of Pantsuit Politics. This is Beth. Sarah is on her summer break this month. You will hear Sarah's voice today. We recorded a very serious conversation about wearing shorts for the Outside of Politics section that we always end our show with. Before I introduce the main topic today, I would love to invite you to join our email list. We send out a note every Friday, and we put a lot of care into those notes. I love to write when it's my turn. And I always look forward to reading what other team members have written when it's not my turn. I know we all get a ton of mail. I promise this is not a sales piece. It is an expression of our appreciation and love for this audience. So if you would like to see us once a week in your inbox, you can sign up on our website, pantsuitpoliticsshow.com. This has been a summer of curveballs for me and really for everyone I know and love. Some of those curveballs are easily managed. My curveball of the day is that I plan to record part of this podcast with my dad, and my dad ended up needing a small emergency medical procedure that he is undergoing as I record. He will be okay, and I feel a tremendous amount of gratitude for the fact that he will be okay and that my sister and brother-in-law are with him through this. But there are curveballs that force us to completely regroup, sometimes even start over, to have to rebuild our lives from the ground up. How we respond to unexpected events, canceled flights, sickness, lost jobs, devastating weather events, all of it is shaped so significantly by the messages we learned about ourselves as kids. What is our value? What did we learn about our resilience? How did we come to understand and work with our own emotions? Because of that, here on our show about politics, Sarah and I spend a lot of time talking about parenting. Parents raise citizens, and how they do it defines who we become as a nation. Today, I want to share a conversation with Mary Van Geffen. I hired Mary to be my parenting coach a little over a year ago. I never thought I'd be a person who hired a parenting coach. I'm not sure I knew that a parenting coach existed until maybe three or four years ago. But I wanted some specific help from Mary. I needed to understand how to respond when my kids fight with each other. I have such loving, wonderful parents, and I follow their examples around many things in my own parenting. But I'm 12 years older than my only sister, so I never saw their example of what to do when kids pick at each other and yell at each other and sometimes shove each other. Now, I know with my own kids that how I handle any individual argument is no big deal. But I also know that the overall messages I send to them about who they are and how they treat each other and how they deserve to be treated by each other is a very big deal. So I wanted Mary to help me answer the question, who do I want to be when my kids are fighting? But I got a lot more than that from my time working with her individually. So I asked her to talk with me here about her work and how parenting shapes the people we become. I hope this conversation might give you some windows into what you learned about yourself as a kid and how that shapes your response to the endless series of curveballs our politics and our lives will continue to throw. I want to first talk about gentle parenting, which is how I understood what I was signing up for, right? I was getting a gentle parenting coach. And I was thinking about gentle as applying to my kids, that I want to be a parent who's not super reactive, who isn't yelling all the time. And in my work with you, I realized that maybe the gentleness is more about me and Chad than it is about them, that we're that we're not signing up to add a bunch of expectations and a bunch of rules for ourselves as parents. We are more saying, let's let's talk about who we want to be and how we want to enjoy these years and what that could look like for us as a family. So I'm curious how you define gentle parenting in your own mind and in your work. Well, I think it's a combination of a lot of different schools of thoughts. And I think everybody's gentle parenting is going to be different. I don't believe that it's like, this is the one way to parent. 
I think there's an underlying foundation of staying calm or coming back to calm, choosing kind and being firm where it's needed, even when it's really uncomfortable. So calm, kind, and firm is sort of, to me, the foundation of it. It is also respectful. There's mutual respect. It's not as hierarchical. And yet these humans are brand new to the earth and they do need us to be in charge. And I think that gets lost a little bit with the gentle parenting method. It's more of a practice than an arriving. I don't know if anyone's like, yay, it happened today at 9.05. I be, I am now a gentle parent. It's more um, every day saying, I am going to show up consciously and present to not just what my kids are going through, but what I'm going through. And I think that's the gentle part you're talking about that's self-reflective and reparenting and putting a hand on your heart and your belly to say, oh, this is really hard for you. It's amazing to me how well-meaning parents want to skip almost like a hurdle. Let me just get over the part about I have needs and I have pain from my past. And let me just be the best parent for this child. And not necessarily does everybody have to go to therapy, although everyone will be better off in therapy, but you, we do have to start with checking in with ourself and being a loving and compassionate force for ourselves in order to do that for our children. So we can't really skip it as much as we want. And I get so many clients showing up being like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. I just, I just want to hire you so that you can tell me what I'm doing wrong. And it's, it's an interesting sort of self-flagellating space that we find ourselves. And some of that is because of the greater culture. I mean, if you're looking at moms on Instagram, then you have an expectation that you're going to have these dreamy, soft focus sitting in a field with your skirt spread out, reading Little House on the Prairie. And that's not what gentle parenting ends up looking like. It's a spiritual discipline of showing up over and over again to love someone who's not being lovable. And to know that those messages of what is lovable or not lovable are like packed down from your own past, from the choices you had to make to be the most received and we kind of have to unwind that whole ball to show up as as the parent we want to be. And I just think it's like these poor people did not sign up for this. I just want to have kids. And then you realize what like a what a, a soul shaping and just fall apart to build yourself up thing that parenting can be. It doesn't surprise me at all that people come to you wanting some rules. <laughs> Because the other piece of Instagram, which is, you know, primarily where I came to know of your work and where I imagine many people do, the other aspect of Instagram, in addition to, like, the the meadow mom, is the, the slide mom, right? I got, like, five rules on cards on a slide that I can swipe through. And these are things that I don't do or things that I do do that make me a good mom. Mm. And I wonder how you think about that rule-based approach I feel like it's reflective of what I most learned from you, that all these ideas I have about what makes a good or a bad parent have very little to do with me and more my fear that I will not do right by my kids. Yes. And so often we don't even know our rules. There are these like narratives that we operate off of, like a good mom has children that sit still at church. You know, and, it, and we don't say yeah. that to ourselves, but we just believe that. And so when our kid is pinching their brother, we're like, what's wrong with me? And meanwhile, like it's so age appropriate that a kid can't sit still in a pew with boring, non, um, you know, child centric stuff. And yet we are here to, to teach them and titrate towards becoming more and more an adult. But I think we force down adult behavior because we're so afraid of these beliefs we have. Um, you know, I think some of us who are people pleasers feel like a good mom means our child is happy. And that's not true. There's some of us who have been given an assignment of a very melancholy Eeyore child. And if we are going to believe that that we've succeeded, if we've changed that child's temperament, it's just going to be us butting heads and feeling unsuccessful. So I think being really clear of like, what is a good mom? There's no universal answer to that. It really becomes 
what will feel like I've done my job at the end. And even job is like intense because this is a relationship. Yeah. What kind of relationship do I want to build? And I think if you're stuck in the rules, one great place to start is to say, let me fast forward 20 years from now. My child is coming home from wherever they're off with their friend and they're so excited to be back in my home and they're telling their friend and their friends like, settle down. What What's so great about your parents? Or, and listening into that future child's answer, what do they say about what it's like to be in relationship with you, to be in your home and, and extract that and write it out. And that is what being a good mom is. And likely it's not like she taught me how to make my bed every day and I never wear stained clothes. Like that's not going to be what builds a relationship. I think that you helped me understand too that my relationship, what would make me a good mom, what would have my future children saying beautiful things that I would wish them to say about our relationship in the future is very much dependent on who I am, that there isn't one script for this. So you had me do a lot of self-reflective exercises when we first started working together to kind of say, what parts of you do you want to pull out in your motherhood? I wonder if you would talk more about why you begin that way. Well, I think our values are so like, we're like such delicate, unique creatures, each human based on what we've, like the environment we've grown up in some of our wounding, some of our great strengths, our temperament. And I think getting at the core of like, what's most important to me, maybe for me, it's independence and self-sustainability. And then there's a mom two doors down who's like communal feelings of caretaking. Those are both beautiful sets of values. And the times when we are most upset with our kid or with ourselves are often when we've stepped on our values. Or when we have to choose one value to honor, like let's say nature is important, but so is reading, but we bring the books to the park and they won't let us read to them. Like, okay, (laughs) you are honoring the fact that you've got your kid in nature. So I think it's really important to figure out what are your like top five values? Because everything can't be important. That's also just a recipe for exhaustion. If everything's important, nothing happens. And so figuring out like, what what is important to me and also what are my strengths maybe i'm not great at playing and i don't want to be playful but i want to be a person who completely listens when my child talks and is okay seeing who they are versus who i want them to be like that is enough and this this is hard for moms that enter the game with a low self esteem and a background of having to be a certain way to get love um you're not going to be really conversant in what your strengths are if you're a person that like Somebody compliments you and you say, oh, no, this thing. Oh, gosh, no. You know, if that's your jam, you've got some work in front of you to raise your 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 confidence in what you are good at, which is going to be very different than what I'm good at. I think that it was a real gift to learn what I am good at and to focus on that in my parenting because it gave me such an appreciation for what my partner is good at. Mm-hmm. And see him focus on that in his parenting instead of thinking, again, there's like just this one way to be a good parent. And I remember having like kind of a tough conversation with you where I was talking about how I Chad and I get frustrated with each other. He thinks that I am not firm enough. I think he goes a little past firm into a category that's not particularly helpful. <laughs> and thinking about my strengths and then thinking about his strength and what our kids can pick up from both of us. You you said to me as I was talking through this, like, do you think you owe him an apology? And I did. I absolutely did because I really did think like on some level, there is a right way of interacting with our kids and I'm closer to it than he is and he should get on board with me. And it's been so nice, I think, for all of us to let go of that. And to say he's parenting from his strengths and I'm parenting from mine. Yes. And I sometimes get sad when I see the missed opportunity for some dads to have like a deep relationship because they're kind of playing that role of like, oh, who was that? What friend was that? It's like the friend they've had since second grade, like clue in. There is definitely different styles of handling conflict and, and one parent might be much more okay with a kid upset which I think is an important 
space to be in. And I think sometimes there's this, I don't know if it's like the sitcom dad trope that's like bled its way into the family, but there's this thought that the sometimes that the mom is the manager of the relationship and the father is out gathering, you know, and hunting or whatever. And that's a detriment because, you know, I'm still a person that calls and I talk to my mom and then my dad will speak to her and she says, your dad says this or that. And it, and what a loss to not have your own one-on-one relationship. I've been having to, I don't know if it's weaponized incompetence, um, I've had to feign not knowing a few times to allow my partner to step in and go ask directly to the children rather than me giving reports of the children's life, which feels like 18th century England. (laughs) It does. And I think that 18th century England is a nice way to categorize that. I feel less of that happening in my house because of societal trends that we're a part of. That from the beginning of our marriage, we have both been breadwinners. There isn't like a dynamic of one of us goes out and works and the other one doesn't. Uh, For the last several years, we've both worked from home and traveled. So we're both here a lot. We're both here when they get on the bus. We're both here when they get off the bus. And also, we both have, you know, days at a time when we're away and the other person is the primary parent. So Our dynamic just can't slot into that sitcom lifestyle because of the macro factors that have us in a different type of relationship. And I wonder if you're seeing, especially, you know, post-COVID or during COVID when more people were working from home, any like shifts in relationships that created those types of shifts around parenting. Well, I want to commend you because there are many people in your position that are still shouldering 75% of the work Mm. and grumbling and bitter and um, exhausted because it's just ingrained into women that we're supposed to be the selfless ones, the empty vessel expressing ourselves in homemaking. And, you know, I think about that statement behind every successful man is a strong woman. Like what? Yeah. I'm not into that. (laughs) This is what we grew up in. And so it's, it's, it's an earthquake in a relationship to begin to say, oh, wow, you know what? I I don't want to be in charge of that anymore. And I can't report from the finish line. I'm in the middle of that. But as a, as someone who just started working, you know, I started working when my kids were 10 and now they're 18 and 16. So it's been new to our relationship. And what I notice in a lot of the people I coach is just sort of it's like the mother is in charge of everything and she's trying to figure out how to um, also educate the dad at the same time about the kind of parenting that she knows to be um, the way forward and to be more evolved and more conscious. And I, I think when a, when a woman kind of wakes up and says, wait a second, why would I have to be the one to figure out carpool? Like I did a revolutionary thing this year. I added all the fathers to the carpool text stream. And in the moment, I thought, oh, why am I doing this? Why I literally had an internal voice is, don't bother them with this. And I thought, mm. what? There is so much. Don't bother them with this. Wow. I literally, yeah. And there's so much, you know, every day there's a message. So-and-so can't go. This one can. And it felt revolutionary to say, we're partners in this. And I think maybe a lot of women listening will get that, that there are just things that we signed up for that we didn't know we signed up for. And then you start to wake up and think, well, why would I be responsible for all meal prep and, and buying food? And so, you know, I'm kind of making that shift. And I also really want an Alice. I don't know if you grew up watching the Brady Bunch that might, you might be too young, oh, but an Alice would be great. <laughs> and nobody shamed Carol Brady because Carol Brady didn't have a job outside the home that I can remember she just needed help because she had six kids and the dynamics of a blended family. And, you know, Alice would come in and take care of all the administrative things of running a family of which there's not a lot of glory in. And as I say this, there may be somebody who's listening who's like, y'all don't get it. I love to express myself in this way. And that's wonderful. There are people who love to cook or they love to clean and see the the, the closure of a, of a beautiful you know, space restored. But if that's not you, you can really feel like, oh, you know, it it bleeds into your parenting 
that you're not succeeding in this other area. And I feel like Instagram and COVID and well, the quarantine are just sort of waking up women to a story we didn't know we were we were choosing. You know, it's interesting. My version of Alice that I have said to Chad a hundred times is that I would like to have a Mr. Belvedere. <laughs> so I, I guess I've always had like a little bit more of a gender balanced perspective on those types of household chores because I grew up watching Mr. Belvedere. Yes. And what, what, what were his responsibilities? He was the butler. So he cleaned, he cooked. He was there when the kids came home from school. The, the kids in the family all had a very like close relationship. We tell Mr. Belvedere about our lives. And and I have desired that in my house for a long time. Just one more person to help us out. Yes. I mean, there would be a lot less friction in relationships if we took out the time constraint. I think time and deadlines is one of the things that makes parenting the hardest in this modern society. It's like, I've got to get this kid to this place by this time. And it adds this intense pressure And, you know, children operate in this like la la land, um, slow unfolding space. And when we bring that pressure, we've got to get this done. We've got to leave now. It's so hard to be a good parent. I've had to tell multiple people that like, I can't give you a technique for ramming that kid out of bed at 730 and into the car by 740. It looks more like we get up at seven and we leave room for staring off into space. And like, that's an important part of integrating who this kid is into themselves. And I think that just kind of holding on to, again, like that balance of strength, because my kids unfold most completely at bedtime. And it seems not to matter when bedtime begins, how much space we allow around bedtime. There's never enough to contain Mm -hmm. everything they really want to workshop before they go to bed at night. Uh, especially my seven-year-old, that is when all of her emotions from the day hit her. I can almost visualize her processing her entire day as her head hits the pillow, and she wants to talk it through. So I try to remember that, like, Chad has this excellent strength of bedtime is important. We honor the need for sleep that we have here. We will have a better day tomorrow if we get to sleep now. And I'm pretty good at saying I take your feelings seriously. This is a real thing that's happening for you. Can we do a little bit of processing now and figure out what we're going to leave to talk about tomorrow? I could not do that on my own. We would be up until two in the morning every night just really sorting Ellen's stuff out if it were just on me. Yeah, he brings that structure. And so it's like going through the the airport. You know, one person might be really good at like, oh, no, this is the gate we need to go to. I'm reading this. And the other person's like, I'm meeting the other travelers and bringing them into this experience. And you need both. And and it's not always defined by gender roles. You know what I mean? There can be a very Mm -hmm. structured female or, you know, non-binary in this situation. But usually somebody has to play that almost because they don't see it in the other. And so sometimes I think one parent might double down and become even more feely centric because they're of the fear or the anxiousness that the other parent isn't showing it at all. So we kind of move into extremes of ourself in relationship. I'm glad that you said non-binary because I was thinking as I was preparing for this conversation about how it would be very mother-centric. That's who you work with. I am a mother. And how I want to do that not to be exclusive in any way, but to be particular about what we're talking about. Because there is a particularity of parenting as a mom with a dad in the house. And that dynamic you were describing of when you have those two people living together So much societal stuff comes with that relationship that you are navigating. Uh, it It is not the only way to be a family. It is a way. And when you are in that way, it has a lot of dynamics that we're still trying to unravel. Well, and I've coached several couples that are lesbians. And I think that there's no one way that that works out either. Sometimes they slip into the roles that it's just easy because that's how culture is set up. And Mm -hmm. other times it's this gorgeous, you know, just more in like relational motivated experience. So if we're thinking about motherhood in that lens of 
I'm trying to stop excluding dad from the carpool text. We define it a lot as though martyrdom is a goal. Like, I, I find that especially around Mother's Day, we're doing a lot of celebration of martyrdom. <laughs> I think in terms of policy, uh, we are resistant to policies that alleviate caregiving from mothers because I think there is something in us that really celebrates motherhood as martyrdom. I felt like gentle parenting was, in many ways for me, an invitation out of that martyrdom. And I wonder if if you think of it that way or how you see that manifesting. Mm. Well, that just shows how cool how cool your brain is, because I don't think I've put that together before, but I do have a long antenna for victimhood and how that just sabotages a family. And I do think that there are these messages that you should, you give your all and that like, yes, there's just so much of like, oh, we're so thankful for our mothers and how much they sacrifice. Well, wait a second. Why does it have to be a sacrifice? So I think with gentle parenting, noticing that voice in you that says, I have to give it all. I'm not important here. Their needs are important. Like noticing that voice that's kind of a victimy voice or a pleasing, a people pleasing, like I need everyone to be happy or becoming aware of, because we've all got an inner critic and a, a narrator happening. We just aren't always aware of it. So becoming aware of it and deciding what do you believe about that? Because gentle parenting is about being respectful and of what is, you know what I mean? Like noticing who the person is and showing up for that version of a child versus here's who I need you to be. And we can, we can hold a vision for like, you know, we're a family that uses kind words and we're also a family that loves to learn. And meanwhile, we're looking at this kid who is not using kind words and wants to watch hour three of TV, right? So we can hold this other space, but if we're operating out of like, oh, we, and you can feel it in your body. This is where embodiment really helps, I think when it's time to make sandwiches, if you feel that martyr in you and the martyr tends to like hang her head and be in sort of a C curve with her back, like noticing that, like, what, what is that? Where, where am I believing I don't have choice? Cause that's where martyrdom comes from. Maybe not. I mean, I think martyrdom is like, I will gladly give my body. There go my breasts. You know what I mean? They're, they're destroyed. And so is my whole pelvic area. Like I don't think that that means you're a better mom. You know, it, I think if you think about being what it's like to be raised by a martyr, I mean, doesn't that immediately send shivers down your back? Like, yes, you can't please them. It's never enough because they're they're locked in this vision of themselves as being misused in some way by the experience. I don't know. How do you see gentle parenting Doving with this martyrdom as mother? Well, I think it has allowed me, again, to say, here's what I'm good at and here's what I'm not good at, and to not feel guilty about not being good at everything and to recognize that what I'm not good at, there are other adults in my kids' lives who can do that. I think that the focus on, you know, you talk a lot about trying to find adults who will pursue your children for like loving relationships with them. So saying you are not the the center of their universe and don't have to be forever. I think thinking about myself in a different posture based on their ages has been really helpful to understand, especially now with my 12-year-old, that my goal is is so much about ensuring that she has everything she needs to craft her life. So sometimes she'll say to me, can you do this for me? Can you, you know, ask my violin teacher if we can change my lesson time? And I'll say, I think that you're capable of doing that. And I just take so many tasks off my own list and see that as better parenting than doing it all for her. It's just really helped me define my role as less about what can I provide all of these people and more who can I be around these people. And that's been so nice. Who can I be and what would be the highest good in this moment? Is mm-hmm. it to to just make nice and get like, you know, my daughter woke up this morning and was, it was like, I'm in a real rush. Can you make me um, oatmeal? And it's an art, this gentle parenting. Cause it's like, well, hold on. Let me think about this. Like in this instance, 
she had worked last night and she wasn't feeling well. And so it was kind of like a hell yes. Right. But there are other times where I want to help her feel the yuckiness of, of not planning ahead and sort of like Mm -hmm. that, you know, natural consequences is I guess what people love to say about it, but no one can be like, write a one page edict on when to help them and when not, because it really is an art because we are trying to equip them to be able to walk this earth without us. And so I think part of martyr to motherhood is hoping you will always be this huge son in their life that they need. And that's really bad for everybody. It reminds me so much of kind of this whole going through this. This is my second Mother's Day where I'm on the internet telling people that Mother's Day should really be whatever makes the person in the trenches feel great. The person who is wiping noses and not sleeping um, through the night. That's what this, it shouldn't, what ends up happening is that person is then off doing all the work for that older mother, the grandmother, Mm -hmm. trying to make them feel special. And it just, it seems backwards and and almost patriarchal that we, we have to go add further weight to this exhausted newish mother who doesn't have the brain space to plan some pageantry for some older mother. Like it's just to me, one more example of us kind of creating martyrdom expectations. Yeah. And I think that oatmeal example is such a great one because another way that gentle parenting has helped me out of martyrdom is that I realize I can think about that calculus But I don't have to think about it so much every single day that I am constantly worried I'm going to make the wrong decision, that I can say it is an art and it is a long game. So the one time that I do or don't is just a is a drop in the experience of me for her. And it's okay if I deprive her of the lesson of the consequences or I add a drop to her thinking about me as someone who will who will always show up for her. You know what I mean? Like taking a longer view has been really valuable. Yes. And I think of, is it Maya Angelou or is it Gandhi? Whoever says like, it's not about what you do. It's how they feel in your presence. What did it feel like to be with you? And you can be saying no in a lovely, pleasant way and holding space for upset and have created a a firm long-term relationship versus sort of, okay, uh, all right, well, now I got to do this. It's that whole culture of busy um, when you show up at the car line and someone's like, well, she didn't tell me she needed cupcakes. And, uh, and it's like, they almost love it. That that yeah. personality loves how needed they are. And oh my gosh, it's really hard. I take it from me if someone who was an 18 year old who's leaving for college soon, you just aren't needed in that way. And so building up your your ability to be separate and distinct like you said something like it's important that, that that I make sure they have everything they need yes and it's important that you have everything you need and so what does it look like as they begin to grow up for you to be doing things that light you up that are separate from your role as mother how do you express yourself? What tickles you that could be your own thing? And then it's so amazing that they get to see that, like to to see you living a full life that's not just about service. Mm -hmm. And I can do that thing where it's like, woe is me, I'm so busy, (laughs) because I am pretty hardwired to say like hard work is a value. And I've really been trying to Figure out how to convey as a mom, uh, hard work is valuable. Like pursuing excellence is valuable. I want that experience for you in, in certain places in your life, just not in all the places all the time. And so for me, pursuing excellence in lunchbox design is just not on my list. But pursuing excellence with my writing is so what's on your list? You know, what what are you excited about? And and that's just been a nice shift to realize, like, I can instill that value in them in a more focused way than I have it in myself. And that takes so much pressure off both of us. Mm. I can almost see you creating a pursuing excellence yes, no list. Like, yes, I will pursue it in these ways. No, I will let it be okay that it is imperfect and and 
barely done in these other ways, because that's the only way it could be sustainable to pursue right. excellence is if there were some other areas where you were not, and you're pursuing rest and recharging as well, which is sort of that shadow side for some who are real high achievers. I've been thinking a lot about what a luxury it is that I got to work with a parent coach, that I got to spend several hours one-on-one with a professional thinking hard about who I want to be as a mom, you know, identifying cultural reference points that I can come back to over and over again, workshopping specific scenarios, like what a luxury that is and how much privilege is in my life that I get to do that. I wonder what you think about the way that social media or classes or other like big scale tools could help more people have a new conversation about parenting? How do we level the playing field a little bit so that parents who are in the trenches, who don't have the luxury of time or cash that I do to invest in this, get some exposure to reparenting themselves, healing new wounds, healing old wounds, thinking through who they want to be as parents? I just, I wish more people could have this gift. And I wonder how, how you think about that. It's the democratization of, of yeah. parenting skills. Yes. Um, one thing I'm working on is is anytime I have, I have I have a class that's very expensive, moms of spicy ones, and it's like it's almost five hundred dollars. And so there, I'm setting aside scholarships for five people, and then I get totally overwhelmed because it's twenty people that are looking for that. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I feel that I am so thankful for Instagram because I do feel like you can follow four different parenting people and get a little thing each day to work on. And yet to not have that to, to process can also start to feel like you're being drowned by parenting advice. I think it's really important to find a listening partner. And this idea comes from Patty Whiffler's hand in hand parenting. And it's the idea of having someone and you can have never met them. They can just be somebody you jived with on the internet or uh, or somebody you met and you take 15 minutes a week to, and they set a timer and you just talk about your experience of parenting. And when you get to talk through it and have somebody listen and hold space for how hard it is, and they're not going to judge you when you say, I hate this kid today. And you can get that vitriol out and process it with another loving human. That makes a huge shift in the trajectory of your parenting. So if you you would be so bold as to ask someone to be your listening partner, it's mutually reciprocal. You give them 15 minutes, they give you 15 minutes. You don't give advice. I think that's crucial. I think being in some kind of community, and I don't mean Facebook community, but finding your people who are also kind of moving towards being a gentle parent, even if they don't know what that is. And then there's, there's lovely books out there. I love this old book from like the the late nineties that was super progressive at the time. Um, Becoming the parent you want to be, I think is looks at all these questions about yourself is really crucial, but I'm an activist for the child. Like I will swoop in and try to protect children from growing up feeling wrong and broken. But I can see that systemically, there should be a parenting um, salon on every corner where you Mm -hmm. come in and you get to tell your story and you get a a little bit of advice or at least just a perspective shift and you go back out into that wilderness of family. But there isn't. Do you have any ideas of how to? No, I love that listening partner idea, though, because I think that's so much of it. So I think mostly about the political side of things, right? And something that I think about from my workplace experiences all the time is how many people just don't get affirmed enough. Mm -hmm. They don't feel seen. They don't feel like anyone understands their experiences, how hard they're working, and they don't feel a sense of affirmation. And I feel like it would radically change our politics if more people felt affirmed more often. Mm -hmm. And so being able to find that by setting aside one relationship to talk about your parenting. I think that's a a wonderful idea. And I just think there are so many ripple effects. I was chatting with one of my daughters last night about a thing with a boy. I will not go into detail. I want to honor her confidence, but a thing with a boy. And it was so interesting because it gave me 
an opportunity at one point to say, you know, how a boy feels about you is not your responsibility. And that was a big moment for her because she was feeling a lot of guilt about this boy having a crush on her. And so being able to say that's not your responsibility, that's huge politically. And then later for her to say, like, what if I did like this person, you know, and and just to kind of have room to try on all these things with me, I think she's going to be a really different adult than an adult who's holding all of that in secret. And I feel like politically we're living the result of a lot of adults who are holding all that in secret, you know? So any suggestion like spend 15 minutes talking to a friend, no advice, I I really welcome and embrace because I think we need so much more of that. Yeah. And I just want to say, Beth, you're such a good mom. Oh, thank you. And you're probably mothering so many women who are listening. It was like, oh, I wish somebody would have told me that a boy's perception of me is none of my business and not my problem. That's beautiful. Um, one one other sort of exercise. I mean, obviously I have a bunch of $49 classes, but the $49 is a lot for somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is, is to journal. And I, most people roll their eyes at the journal thing, but hear me out here. Daniel Siegel's work research shows that the, the strongest indicator of whether or not dysfunction or abuse will continue to the next generation is whether or not the person, this child who was abused or was in an awful situation can articulate what it was like for them. Mm. Then they grow up to be a parent. If they can articulate it, they grow up to, to break those cycles. So you writing out what it was like to be little, as we do this in Moms of Spicy Ones, what was it like for you to be small? What was your reputation like in your family? What do you wish folks would have said to you when you were little? And and just being with and listening to the story of that young part of you, if instead you're the type of person that's like, you know what, my parents did the best they could, or I was a terror, I deserved everything I got. Those are signals, those platitudes that you have not yet done the work um, and that you don't have a lot of empathy for little you. And even parents that were doing the best they could sometimes didn't give you what you need. And so taking time to be with yourself and journal that and write it out and reread it and just tell your story even to yourself is important. I love that. Well, thank you for saying I'm a good mom. If that is true in large part because I've had so much good information from you and I am so grateful for it. And if you have the $49, I will tell you that it's worth every penny. I took your class. What is it called? The class about parenting teens. Shift your parenting teens. Yeah. I took so many notes. I think about it every day. It is, in my opinion, like such money well spent. My parenting coaching with you is invaluable. So I am so grateful for you doing that work with me and for sharing some of it with all of us here today. My pleasure. Up next, because we contain multitudes here, Sarah and I are discussing all things shorts. Sarah. You wanted to talk about shorts. I think we should just begin with our personal stances on shorts. Are you a Mm -hmm, shorts mm -hmm. wearer or no? It's a long journey. How much time do you have? Um, I've never loved shorts because um, I don't love the creep, the crawl, the creep and the crawl. There's a great Instagrammer. I don't have her name in front of me who like reviews athletic shorts for the creep and the crawl and will tell you if they hold up or not. And I've never, ever forgotten one time watching What Not to Wear with Trini and Susanna, the original British team. And Trini said, the problem with shorts <laughs> is you stand up and they're still sitting down. And I That's thought, so That's true. it. <laughs> That's it. It's so good. But you just have to have them. You just got to have some shorts in your life. You know, you have to have them for like places like amusement parks. Even though I've worn a dress to an amusement park, I'm not mad about it. Um... But I do feel like they're sort of an important wardrobe essential for the summer. And so I've made my peace with shorts, and I have found some shorts that not only will I wear, but I actually enjoy. But it has been a long journey for me. It has been a long journey. It's similar for me. I tried to avoid shorts for a very long time. Mm -hmm, I decided mm -hmm. that I would look back on that decision in life with regret Mm -hmm. It is silly for me to tell myself that I'm too old to wear shorts. That is just not true. 
And there are situations where shorts are clearly the best option. So I've been going through a real experiment with shorts, trying to have a little renaissance around them, a shorts shortsaisance, something like that. Shorts shorts um, I really like the on-the-go shorts from Somersault. Those okay. are probably my favorite so far. But I'm experimenting. I'm out there. I'm looking. I'm I'm working with lengths. I'm working with fabrics. I'm trying to find just the thing. Yeah, I found Instagrammer Sophie Hudson through Jamie Golden, and she has this great Instagram highlight reel about shorts, and she calls them starter shorts. Like, just a nice cheap pair from Target or Old Navy where you can get back into it and figure out what you like. I do think my friend Kate is right. I think the key with shorts, especially denim shorts, is sizing way up. They need to be loose and comfy. And I agree with that. I found a pair, really, that probably got me back into shorts a long time ago. They were like Banana Republic, roll up, but they had just a the perfect inseam that didn't creep but wasn't too long because I don't love a Bermuda. I'm just going to be honest. I don't love it for me. And so finding that in between, because I'm also not wearing shorty shorts. Obviously, I didn't wear them in high school. I'm certainly not going to wear them in my 40s. Um, but I do think finding those like nice starter pairs, sizing up. Like I, I invested in a nice pair from Madewell, but I bought them too small and too tight. And so I needed to go up in size. I'm going to do that next time. But it is. It's quite the journey with the shorts. It just really is. But I, I do try to remind myself, like, however I feel about how my legs look, I do love my legs. They are here. They are strong. They are holding me up. They are taking me places. And I want to lay some love on them with a cute pair of shorts. Yes. I think all the time about Kathleen Frazier's poem in which my legs are accepted. I want to be a person who looks down at my legs with real gratitude and sincerity and not disdain at all. So it sounds like you have mostly been on a denim short adventure. Am I hearing you I right? I do like a denim short. Okay. Yes. I, now, I have three pairs that I bought. I found a pair from Target that are like linen-y drawstring shorts, and they don't, by some miracle of magic or witchcraft, right up in the middle. And so I bought them in three different colors, and I do like those a great deal. But I really prefer I really prefer a denim short. I like the just a little bit of additional structure. I'm just a jeans person. I own a truly ridiculous amount of denim. See, I find that the occasions for which I believe shorts are the correct thing to wear, I'm not interested in denim. It's got to be pretty mm. hot for me to want to wear a short. So that's what I really like about this on-the-go fabric from Somersault. It's made from plastic water bottles. Okay. It's moisture wicking. It's super light. They have it in pants too. And I do prefer the on the go pants to the shorts just because okay. I'm, you know, I'm creeping out of this bias, but I'm not just full shorts now. Um, but yeah, I have bought several pairs of denim shorts over the years trying to get myself to like, this is going to be my summer uniform. And I never end up wearing them. Because I do. I love a denim cut off short with like a white linen button up. It's just, I feel like I'm really living my best coastal grandmother life. Or I love a denim short with a cotton summer sweater. I just feel like I'm at the beach. Look at me living my life with a, a nice wind, a crisp breeze. Oh, bring it. Bring it to me. So I do. I prefer a denim short. But again, I just like denim generally. And I don't find denim shorts hot. But again, you got to size way up in the denim shorts. Yeah, and the sizing up is so tricky, too, because the hips and the waist, I just feel like we all have a different ratio there, and the short makers have not properly considered how different the ratios can be in the hips and the waist. I will say, my shorts sit lower than my jeans. Like, I want my jeans to my neck, preferably. I would like the waistline to be approximately at my collarbone. Um, But with the shorts, I actually don't mind... A lower rise. I like them to sit low because I just think you don't have as much pant to <laughs> to balance out the high waist. So they're really going to go high waist on you. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So all of my denim shorts are much lower rise than my actual jeans. I think it's hard to find a cute summer top now that's not cropped, which is another mm-hmm. challenge with the short mm-hmm. wearing because I agree. I want them to sit a little, a little bit lower, but I am not interested in any exposed skin Mm-hmm. Really below my neck or above, <laughs> or above my knee, you know. Can I recommend to you a white linen button up? Let me just tell you, just go out there, 
behave as if you live in a Nancy Myers film like I do all the time. It's great. It works out lovely. I wore one I bought at Walmart out. Finally, I was like, oh, man. I think I finally washed it with something and it and it bled. I was so sad. Got a new one from Amazon. I don't love it as much as the Walmart one, but, man, I love a linen white button-up. I love the look of it on other people. Linen is so tricky, though. I just feel like I'm always wrinkled when I'm wearing it. Yeah, you linen. are. But, again, your shorts are still sitting down, so who cares? Lean in. <laughs> just be wrinkled. Be free. Just be. Yeah, it's okay. summer. You're wrinkled. It's fine. Okay. Well, if you all have shorts recommendations, I'm eager to hear them. Because it is a complex formula that makes a good short. Listen, there's a lot going on. A lot going on with the shorts. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you'll come back next Tuesday. My husband, Chad, will be co-hosting with me. We're going to talk about some headlines and then, by very popular request, tell you about our experience putting solar panels on our house. Until then, have the best weekend available. Pantsuit Politics is produced by Studio D Podcast Production. Elise Knapp is our managing director. Maggie Penton is our community engagement manager. Dante Lima is the composer and performer of our theme music. Our show is listener supported. Special thanks to our executive producers. Martha Brunitsky. Allie Edwards. Janice Elliott. Sarah Greenup. Julie Haller. Helen Handley. Tiffany Hassler. Emily Holliday. Katie Johnson. Katina Zuganellis kasling Barry Kaufman, Molly Kors, Catherine Vollmer, Lori Ladau, Lily McClure, Linda Daniel, Emily Neasley, The Cousins, Tawny Peterson, Tracy Putoff, Sarah Ralph, Jeremy Sequoia, Katie Steigers, Karen True, Annika Uveline, Nick and Elisa Valelli, Amy Whited, Emily Helen Olson, Lee Shea McDonough, Morgan McHugh, Danny Osmond, Jen Ross, Sabrina Drago. Jeff Davis, Melinda Johnston, Michelle Wood, Joshua Allen, Nicole Berkless, Paula Bremer, and Tim Miller.